Perfect. Well, I am going to kick things off. And again, welcome everybody on this lovely Monday morning. Um, we're delighted to be kicking off this new Siren Methods Conversations series today. Our idea here really is to explore um, social care relevant research methods that have intrigued us, that confuse us, um, and that we're really eager to learn more about. Um, there are a lot of people doing really cool social care research right now, and there's a lot more that we could be doing in this space. And so we're hoping that Siren can serve as a medium for introducing you to new and different um, strategies for evaluating the very cool programs that are out there. So I am delighted to kick things off. Dylan, you can go ahead to the next slide. So we're, you, were, you were right. Um, I'm delighted to introduce my uh, friends and colleagues um, from OCHIN, not an acronym, which OCHIN is always eager to tell us. Um, OCHIN is an, an integrated electronic health record platform for over 20, 2,200 clinical sites, I think, around the United States, uh, over 600 community health centers. Um, and they do amazing research on lots of subjects, including on social care. So Arwen Bunce and Suzanne Morrissey are our inaugural Methods Conversations speakers. And I just want to tell you a little bit about them before they kick off. So Arwen is a medical anthropologist and an OCHIN qualitative research scientist with an interest in the application of rigorous and innovative qualitative research methods to the study of health and healthcare systems. She's worked with underserved communities domestically and abroad for over 20 years, uh, including stints evaluating programs uh, for uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. Oh my God, those of you who speak French are gonna be so embarrassed for me. Um, the US Department of State and Family Health International as well. So her recent work has focused really very squarely on the intersection of social risk and health uh, information technology. Um, and she's doing this work really to, with the goal of improving the experience of providing and receiving care in the US. Suzanne Morrissey, her partner in crime at OCHIN, is an academic and applied medical anthropologist whose career in public health research began with HRSA funded intervention studies um, on infant mortality and smoking sensation. She also directed an HIV AIDS care and prevention services agencies for a number of years as an associate professor of anthropology and interdisciplinary studies at Whitman College for more than a decade. She taught courses in critical medical anthropology, cross-cultural health systems, integrative medicine, um, and, and it, the list goes on. So Suzanne held a Fulbright Distinguished Scholars Ch Research Chair appointment at McMaster in Ontario, Canada. And since becoming a research scientist at OCHIN, she's been involved in a lot of different projects at the intersection of health IT, social medicine, and health disparities. So you can see why I would uh, want them to be our inaugural speakers today. There is a little bit of irony here in that I did ask Arwen and Suzanne to talk about realist evaluation, and they're going to make a big point about how uh, realist evaluation is not a method. So it's sort of funny to invite them to do the, the first methods conversation, um, but you'll soon hear from them about why it's such an important methods adjacent topic, and it felt very appropriate for today's conversation. I've learned so much from the two of them, and I'm confident that you all will too. Okay, so before I turn things over to them, I just want to give you a heads up on today's logistics. So they're hoping to reserve 15 to 20 minutes to respond to questions after the presentation. Please keep yourself muted um, throughout the presentation portion of the event so that when your dog starts barking, we don't know. Um, use the chat function for questions. They might ask you to unmute or to restate or clarify your question during the discussion session. We are recording this conversation. We will make it available to everybody. Um, inevitably, there'll be a question in the chat about it. Yes, we will make it available to everybody. Um, and then just finally, uh, I just want to invite you to share ideas for future methods conversations topics. Um, you can feel free to send me an email directly or to send our Siren main email, which is listed here, um, uh, an email just saying, hey, you know what I want to learn more about is X. Uh, and I'll share some more about how to connect with us on social media or to, to uh, send us your ideas later. 
Um, but our next methods conversation is scheduled or is about to be scheduled for September, uh, where folks from OHSU will be sharing some of the work that they that they are doing in the quantitative space. Um, and then we have an open slate. So we really welcome your ideas. All right. With all that said, I am going to turn it over to, to Suzanne and Arwen. Thanks again for joining us today. And please use the chat function. Thank you so much, Laura. Oh, great. Okay. And Dylan, thank you as well. Um, Dylan's going to advance our slides for us. I want to um, thank them both for inviting Arwen and I to launch this methods conversation series. And as Laura mentioned, Arwen and I are both medical anthropologists. Um, we've been doing qualitative research uh, for decades between us, and we're both in OCHIN, yes, a nonprofit health center controlled network that does serve predominantly FQHC members who share a single instance of the EPIC EHR electronic health record. So what we're going to do today is walk you through a mile high overview of realist evaluation, and then we'll dip into its uses by way of examples of projects that we're currently working on. This explanatory approach to program evaluation is referred to interchangeably as realism, realistic evaluation, and realist evaluation. And Arwen and I have been honing our skills in it through a series of virtual webinars and workshops with the Nottingham Realist Group and a British-based Center for Advancement in Realist Evaluation and Synthesis called CARES. It's appealing to us for how it brings together other approaches we're familiar with, like grounded theory, process evaluation, and thematic analysis. And it builds flexibility into when and how in a qualitative assessment, for instance, you apply its practices. So we'll provide those examples for you in a little bit. Um, and we want to do that to show the ways in which it can happen at different stages in social care research and for different reasons for a project of a project. So I'm going to turn it over to Arwen for a moment, and then I'll come back to you. So Dylan, you can advance the slide. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so before we get to the sort of nitty gritty of the approach, I just wanted to start us off um, by telling you a little bit about my path to realist evaluation. So about eight years ago, I found myself sort of in this familiar and frustrating situation where I spent four years collecting a lot of data, um, asking for a lot of time and goodwill from CHC providers and staff um, while we were conducting sort of a more traditional qualitative process evaluation of an intervention. And you know, I had tons of really, really interesting perspectives and anecdotes and context, but when it came right down to it, I found that I didn't have the right data to answer the questions about why and how the program or the intervention worked as it did. Um, and so that sort of set me off on this quest to find to find a better way. Um, and that's when I got to realist evaluation. I was really looking for something that would help me sort of figure out what the right questions were to ask earlier um, to get to the answers that we actually needed to understand how programs and interventions worked. Um, and I will say it's been and continues to be a journey. Like Suzanne mentioned, we are, we are still learning for sure. Um, but we are both increasingly convinced that this is really the realist approach is a very sort of valuable approach in implementation science and health services research. Um, and so we're really excited to be here today to share it with you. So thanks. And uh, next slide, please, Dylan. Thank you. Great. So um, just to start us off, uh, realism is a philosophy of science that is theory driven and it situates itself epistemologically between positivism, so a view of the world as directly observable and knowable, and constructivism, which views the world um, in terms of uh, the nature of reality as unknowable in the form of any tr real truth, um, because it believes in knowing observations are filtered through individual perceptions and experiences. So the realist approach offers a bridge between those paradigms and uses theory to understand reality when reality is assumed to exist beyond and independent of our knowledge and beliefs. So evaluation, according to a realist, should occur in a space between what's directly knowable and what people believe reality to be. 
So once data are gathered around the observable as well as the perceived, evaluators come to rest on program theories that represent a correspondence between a claim about the world and the world itself. So while asserting that both the material and social worlds are real, insofar as anything that can cause effect is indeed real to someone, whether we see it or not, realists are wary of simple correspondence concepts of truth. They instead say that no description or explanation of the world is better than any other and rely on real world data derived from observational methods as well as extant scholarship about how the world works and changes. And we'll be talking more about that, the blending of methods in a bit. So realism doesn't take an either or and cause and effect stance on explaining our surroundings, but instead assumes a both and stratified approach. And so it looks at three levels at once, um, empirical, events that are observed and experienced, the actual, that which is generated by the real yet may not be observable, and the real, so causal structures and mechanisms with enduring properties. Often in realist uh, webinars and, and lectures that Arwen and I have been to, there's a flower metaphor that's used to explain this, where the petals of the flower are in relatively clear view. So this is the empirical domain, but much of the rest of the flower, the actual domain is not, although we can reasonably infer that it is actually there and that we could see it if we were to look from a different angle. The soil in which the flower is growing and the nutrients that it contains, the real domain, are out of the reach of our visual field. This means that we can only know anything about its predisposed properties, such as the quality of the soil, by observing the real effects that they have on the flower and building a theory about it. So Dylan, if you wouldn't mind um, going to the next slide and I'll elaborate a little bit more. As Laura was saying, um, we had to joke a little bit about the irony of us opening a method series with an approach that we say is not itself a methodology. That said, realist evaluation both informs and is informed by the methods applied to understanding intervention outcomes. Again, to bring us back to positivism and constructivism and how realism sort of flows down the middle of those, while positive studies typically involve quantitative data collection and qualitative methods underlie constructivist approaches, realism is inherently mixed methods. It's usually qualitative forward because the focus is actually on actions of people who are implementing interventions and receiving interventions in particular contexts. However, it looks to quantitative data for results and more complex analyses. Because as I was saying with that flower metaphor, without knowing certain outcomes, you can't start to dig more deeply into what the mechanisms of change may have been to get to that outcome. So it makes more sense, most sense, to describe realist evaluations as either methods agnostic, or some people say that it's methods eclectic, because methods are not prescribed, but rather selected based on the questions being asked. It integrates well, we found, with pragmatic mixed methods trials, such as ones that Arwen and I work on, that really seek to understand the interactions, that's an important term here for a realist evaluation, the interactions of study context, program features and actors, and how those interactions produce certain outcomes. So you'll hear us talk about those features a bit more. Uh, next slide, Dylan, if you wouldn't mind. So realist evaluation is used to assess new interventions, study programs that have demonstrated mixed methods in the past and to scale up or adapt interventions for variable contexts. It operates from a distinct approach to understanding causality as nonlinear and complex and is grounded in the search for mechanisms of change that may be unobservable. In realist parlance, it gets referred to as ontological depth um, and also a search for underlying causal processes like that which I was describing above with the flower metaphor. So simply put, in realism, 
program outcomes are seen as being caused by mechanisms. And these get, can be, they don't have to be, but this is the approach we've taken. They get disaggregated into resources and reasonings that are attached to human action. And these are either triggered or inhibited by the interactions within and across systems, systems that include an intervention itself, as well as the setting context in which it occurs. So important to a realist evaluation are both context and the individual actors. They are seen as central to impacting outcomes. Um, next slide, Dylan. Thanks. So from philosophical underpinnings, Ray Pawson and Nick Tilley developed the first realist evaluation approach in 1997 to make program evaluations useful to decision makers and practitioners by getting beyond simply assessing whether an intervention worked or didn't work, and instead asking how and why a program does or does not work for whom and under what circumstances. The complete realist question is, what works for whom, in what respects, to what extent, in what context, and how? It's a mouthful. Uh, the approach involves an interactive, iterative process of toggling back and forth between data and hunches about program successes and failures, as well as testing program theories against existing scholarship. For these reasons, realism is a great approach when you have a team of researchers, especially interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary researchers and stakeholders with whom you can volley ideas. Next slide. Thanks. In a realist world, interventions are seen as theories in action. So you're hearing theory quite a bit. Again, theory-driven approach is what we're doing. Um, so the interventions themselves are seen as theories in action, whereby program outcomes are caused by the activation of mechanisms within those contexts, um, particular contexts where you're, you're trying them out. In other words, to make sense of why programs work or don't work, multiple and variable theories are actually tried on to explain the complex interactions. These are theories, as I mentioned earlier, that approximate reality. So theories are approximations because out of the infinite contextual factors that may affect why a program does or doesn't work, only some will actually rise to explanatory value, value that gets seen in terms of generating useful knowledge and transferable lessons on how to roll out, scale up, or implement elsewhere. And because of this, Replicability isn't the driving force behind analysis and dissemination of realist findings. And in fact, in realist evaluation, it's perfectly acceptable, if not expected, that there will be limitations to replicability because of the focus on circumstantial variability of program implementation. So instead, what we're responsible for is clarity and transparency around the decision-making process that got us to our theories of how and why programs work or don't work. That's what's expected of us. So I'll turn it over back over to Arwen for a bit, um, and then I'll talk to you again in a, a moment. Next slide, please. Okay. So being a realist researcher is it's really like being a detective. I always think of Sherlock Holmes when I, when I talk about this slide here, but you're trying to go from sort of the concrete or observable, what uh, Suzanne was calling the empirical, um, back to the causal or sort of the underlying social structures and mechanisms. And the goal is to establish this causal link, which is also known as a generative mechanism, uh, between the intervention and an observed outcome. And a key tenet here is that there's more to reality than that which is experienced. Next slide, please. So how does one do this? And one of the main tools for realist evaluation is something called a CMO configuration, which stands for Context Mechanism Outcome. And really, these are just sort of your hypotheses, your evidence-based educated guesses about how an intervention is going to exert its effects within specific contexts. Um, 
these are just a tool. It's okay for them to be messy. You don't need to, you're going to have a lot of CMOs when you're going through a realist evaluation. They don't need to be perfect or tidy. They're really just a tool to sort of keep you focused on this pathway to change and not get distracted by sort of all of these shiny, pretty things um, that may not be pertinent. This is really helpful for me who tends to get distracted by shiny, pretty things. Um, and the, the goal of the CMO configuration is really to deliver these granular explanations of sort of what works for whom and in what context. Okay, next slide, please. So in a perfect world, and as you'll hear soon, uh, we, do, we have not done things always <laughs> in this exact realist evaluation ideal way. But in a perfect world, you would formulate these initial program theories or sort of your educated guesses about how things work um, before you even start data collection, right? And then you use these theories to guide your data collection, um, to test, you, you use the data, these sort of iterative cycles of data collection and analysis to test and refine these theories. You use the CMOs to guide that. So really there's this sort of back and forth cycle. So you have your ideas, you sort of test those ideas through your data collection. Maybe you learn sort of new ideas or new perspectives. It causes you to go back and look at often the data you had already collected sort of with this new lens or new perspective. Often you get new insights there that helps you sort of refine the theories that you're working with and sort of on and on. You also start layering in um, what people already know, what's in the literature about the, the topics that you're finding out and the mechanisms that you're starting to see in the data to sort of bring that layer in to help sort of understand on, in a broader sense what might be going on. Um, and, and something that, that is often, um, I know a little uncomfortable for more traditional researchers is that as part of this process, we're explicitly asking um, the people that are impacted by the intervention, what they think about these theories or ideas. Um, that's pretty different than than much research and can often feel leading to some people, I think. So this has been something that we've been playing with, but have been finding incredibly helpful, actually. Um, at a certain point, you sort of discard some of those initial theories that really don't approximate reality, as Suzanne was talking about. Um, and eventually what you hopefully get to are these explanatory theories about what works for whom and under what circumstances. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I was saying, we don't always, we have not always done the ideal. We sort of ended up at Realist Informed, and uh, we're just going to walk you through a couple examples from projects of what that means to us. So next slide, please. So the first uh, project we're going to talk about is called Ascend. Rachel Gold is the PI of this. Um, the, the study is literally looking at how implementation support and implementation support intervention uh, can promote sustained increases in social risk screening. So each clinic was randomized to a wedge um, and each wedge got six months of intensive tailored implementation support through a five step process. Um, and each of those steps was supported through training, facilitation and workbooks. And as you can see here, the third aim of the study was a realist evaluation of the implementation support. Next, please. So this was the first time that we tried using realist evaluation. And I'm just gonna sort of walk you through our analysis approach, some of which worked quite well and some of which we would do differently in the future. Um, so we first started trying to code our data using this context mechanism outcome configuration. Um, that really, for many reasons, ended up not working very well. Um, sort of as an aside, Suzanne will talk to you a bit about another project called Cohere. Um, there we tried using a more grounded approach to coding. That was better, but was still a little bit awkward to use um, sort of in the realist approach. And where we've ended up, and I think we're finding really helpful, is coding by program theory, actually. But so we tried this coding. Frankly, it was a little bit of a waste of time. We didn't end up using it a ton, but at least it got us sort of indirect conversation with the data. Then at the end of each wedge, we created these clinic specific summaries based on those realist concepts of context mechanism outcome. Um, and that was really sort of the start of our analysis for, for thinking through what was going on. And then in year four, so once all of the clinics had been through the intervention, uh, Suzanne and I sort of really dug deep into these summaries 
and started to identify mechanisms. So, so the, you know, the mechanisms through which the implementation support strategies exerted their effects um, and created some initial explanatory theories. And then we went back, we took those theories and we went back um, through these iterative cycles of engagement with the raw data to test and refine these theories. Uh, we brought in, we went out to the theoretical literature and brought some of those ideas in. Um, and I'm not going to get into it in this talk, but we actually ended up using normalization process theory um, to really help us organize and increase the transferability of our findings. Um, so in hindsight, what we, what we found through this first try is that the realist approach was really useful in explaining why and how the intervention worked as it did, for whom, and in what circumstances. Um, but since we didn't identify the mechanisms of those explanatory theories while the work was ongoing, we really missed the opportunity to engage with, with the participants to sort of refine and sharpen our understanding of the causal mechanisms. So we got some really interesting and great data that we're writing up right now, but we definitely sort of missed something that I think would have been helpful for our thinking uh, going forward. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna give one example of the type of program theory um, that came out of this work. So as I mentioned, each of this five steps in the implementation support intervention that we provided was created, was, I'm sorry, was supported by these workbooks. And the workbooks were really sort of originally conceived as a way of sort of an organized, organizational scheme to sort of guide the clinic champion sort of in a linear step-by-step -step way through the sort of multitude of decisions that go into a successful implementation of social risk screening. But what we started hearing, hearing very clearly in the data is that the very materiality of these workbooks often really facilitated collaboration at the clinic level. And this was very important for sort of the uptake and sustainment of social risk screening at those clinics. So the theory here would go that the workbooks really grounded the discussion in a purposeful way which then created a shared sense of purpose and direction among clinic staff in sort of various roles and from various perspectives, which then led to the staff really engaging with the ideas and collaborative decision-making around these goals and processes, which set the stage for implementation and potential sustainment of social risk screening. And I'm not gonna read these quotes, but you can see there that they sort of speak to this idea. Now, clearly not all clinics use the workbooks um, in sort of this collaborative way. And we felt, so those that did tended to have sort of this pre-existing culture of kind of cooperative decision-making and workflow development already in place. The clinics that didn't fell into two buckets. Um, some of them just had a champion who sort of had the authority at the clinic and had the trust of other people and could get by and sort of by themselves to move this work forward and almost quote unquote, didn't need the, the collaborative work to move it forward. Um, then there was another sort of bucket of clinics where SDH screening just wasn't seen as sort of enough of a priority um, to really kind of dedicate what we call thinking time for multiple staff. So there wasn't just time for people to engage in this collaborative work. Um, and I think now I am going to hand it back over to Suzanne to talk about another study. Next slide, please don't. Great, thanks Arwen, and thank you, Dylan. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the COHERE project, which happens to be led by Dr. Laura Gottlieb and Rachel Gold, who holds a joint appointment um, between Kaiser and Ochin. Um, the emphasis of the study was to introduce EHR-based clinical decision support tools that would potentially trigger adjustments to patient care plans in response to awareness of patient social needs. So the idea was that through the suggestion of care plan adjustments, care team members would be reminded and encouraged to actually make such adjustments. Of the study aims, aim three represents where the realist work happens. Questions surrounding who uses the EHR, how and under what circumstances to accomplish social care are foundational to the same. So we went into the qualitative work, wanting to know how clinicians and care teams use the EHR, especially to document and communicate about patient social risks and how social risk data are actually used in their care of patients. Next slide, please. 
concrete. So this slide represents our actual realist approach. We had a, a stakeholder phase and then moved into the pilot phase of the project. And now we're actually doing the trial stage of the project. So the stakeholder data, which involved committee meetings and interviews were used for pilot tool design. And as we gathered qualitative data from interviews and meeting and check-in observations and started coding for context and content, we began to realize that despite strong commitment to social risk-informed care, and certainly a lot of interest in standardizing the use of social risk data in clinical practice, certain tensions interfered with reaching normalization of the process change with these particular tools. So we began to ask why. This led us to identify the tools that were being used and appreciated. And then we returned to previously collected data armed with new information, new perspective, to try to figure out why these specific tools were deemed useful while others were not. So we arrived at three salient generative insights or explanatory insights. And in a true realist approach, we began incorporating questions into our interviews with the pilot clinics about our insights to get their reactions. And through this recursive approach, we refined our understanding of the underlying mechanisms of action based on these conversations. And we continued to engage with previously collected data. And all of this was done in the interest of um, facilitating research team conversations around how to um, adapt the tools to better suit uh, care team's needs and in anticipation of the trial stage of the project. So we organized our insights around points of tension and later use them to adapt our original study hypothesis. Um, next slide, please. Great. So in the yellow uh, are the names that we gave to our insights and we use those names as codes as well when we're going through our data. So the first insight arose from care team members saying that on one hand, they welcome EHR tools for SDH work social determinants of health work for multiple reasons, for ease, for funding and payment, for documentation of their work. On the other hand, tools represent a threat to their sense of self as providers, perhaps. They talked about being called to the work in CHCs and talked also about their vision of good care, which was customized care and empathetic care, patient-centered rather than tool-driven. Uh, and what we were hearing in our interviews and in observing meetings and such was that the care teams were already considering the impact of structural inequalities on their patients, and they were already making adjustments and basically said things like, we don't need computers to tell us what we're already doing. So we called that calling, CHC calling. The second insight was generated by comments about the potential impacts of knowing and documenting in the EHR patients' social risks, impacts that could be negative and positive. Will the information lead to stigmatization and biased care by others down the road? Will the information as recorded open space for scrutiny of provider decision-making? Or does social risk screening prompt important conversations between provider and patient for building trust? shared decision-making and care adjustments. So in short, a discussion arose around the difference between knowing and using patient social risk information and putting it in the chart for others to see. Other concerns were raised around quality of care changing due to unconscious bias or presumptions about what patients are or are not capable of, of doing for their own care um, in terms of self-management, and how to standardize reporting of social risk data that are received from multiple sources and in a variety of ways. These were all ideas that were coming to us that we were able to construct under this theme of care implications. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
The third insight represents a tension that many care team members expressed, that while EHR-based tools can be used to remind providers of their patients' life circumstances, giving them clues into patient narratives for, patient, for relationship building and patient-centered care, the data can be seen as noise and overlooked due to screen fatigue. So related to this tension is an expressed concern that reading and entering data on a screen takes away from personalized care. So the question for many becomes, how can we see data about a patient that is sufficient for reconstructing a bigger picture and make sense across the care team, regardless of the role a care team member plays? And we call this data clues. Next slide. So recall the original hypothesis for COHERE was that EHR-based CDS tools are expected to produce clinical practice change by suggesting possible care plan adjustments for patients with social risks. And from our insights, we considered an emergent theory, and that was that CDS tools are useful when and because they can support staff to document and communicate about patients' social risk information and care adjustments already be being made or being considered. So rather than serving as reminders to make care adjustments, which some providers perceived as being told how to do their jobs, the tools facilitate documentation of social risks in a way that may offer clues about patient needs enable important communication and collaboration around those needs, facilitate shared decision-making, and take stock in what care teams already know and do. And I'm just looking at the clock to make sure that we've got enough time. Um, I think we'll skip the next slide if you wouldn't mind, Dylan. We can always come back to it, but it's just an example of how uh, we started to tweak the tools for the trial phase. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Arwen for a moment. Okay, so this is sort of, this is an example of where we're hoping to go next um, with this realist evaluation approach. So Suzanne and I, along with a colleague, Karen Albright at Ocean, um, recently put in an NIH R01 um, using the realist approach to study how social risk screening can improve the patient clinician care team relationship. Um, and the idea is really to identify and then promote the mechanisms uh, through which social risk screening can evolve into these meaningful conversations that optimize those relationships and ultimately improve patient outcomes. Um, and so to the person who asked about sort of the alignment between human-centered design and the realist approach, um, we would absolutely say yes, they can absolutely complement each other. And in fact, that's exactly how we wrote this grant, where you can see that the second aim there is a human-centered design process. Um, so I think we wanna leave enough time for discussion. There have been lots of really deep and interesting questions coming through. Um, so next slide, please, Dylan. We, these are a list of a few of our sort of favorite realist resources. Um, one thing I will say, if anybody is interested enough in realist approach that you want to read a lot about it, um, there is a listserv that we can maybe on here, but if not, we can share that is absolutely fascinating um, and very active and includes, for instance, uh, Ray Pawson, who is one of the people who um, sort of created realist evaluation. And it's just a really fun space <laughs> with a lot of very quirky people who are very passionate about what they do to sort of follow along. So that's another option. Um, and next slide, I think it's just the thank you and our emails. We would love, Suzanne and I both would, we like talking about the stuff and geeking out on it and continuing to learn. So we would love to hear from you if you have any additional questions or thoughts after this. Um, and then I think we are going to go to the chat and the Q&A, which again, thank you everybody for putting it in. Um, so I'm still getting used to the things that are answered versus not. So I know there's probably some of them that we gave short, some of the questions you put that we gave short answers to that as time we can chat about more. Um, let me just look at some of the ones that we don't yet have any answers to. So examples or insights, on the use of realist evaluation approach to a healthcare system, equity, diversion, inclusion, longitudinal effort, iterative CMO that helps people discover what they think is really going on 
and resulting? That is a really interesting question. I don't know, Suzanne, if you have any thoughts. I mean, I can certainly, I have no examples right now that I know of. Um, I think what you're saying, if I'm reading it correctly, and please jump in, um, is sort of using the CMO process more sort of collaboratively in a group setting rather than only as a sort of research analysis process. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's it. Yeah. I I love that idea. I will say, I don't think, and Suzanne, please jump in if you have. I am not sure, sure that I have ever read or seen it used that way. But I, I have not. It, could be. it certainly could be, yes. Um, and indeed, the, the CMO iterative process is intended to be explored collaboratively as well. So as you're moving through a process of developing program theories and your emergent CMOs, um, you're also returning to the literature um, to test those CMOs and those insights against the literature. Um, you're also going back to your data and you are um, usually, you should be going back to your research team as well as to any of your interlocutors in your research, any of your participants in your projects um, to, to gauge um, the validity of the insights um, and of those CMOs. So I, I don't think that actually answers your question because like Arwen's saying, neither one of us have examples to that effect, but the notion of a, a collective approach to thinking through the CMOs is exactly what's intended of a realist approach. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for <laughs> a non-answer. Um, so <laughs> we have to hear, I see that uh, Laura is saying maybe we can answer them together. Um, I think I'm gonna keep them somewhat separate though. So Carolyn asked, if we can share more about how realist evaluation is or is not changing the sort of data that we're collecting. Um, so I would say, well, yes and no. Um, so it is definitely keeping us focused. Um, so that what I, I really, one of my big issues, apart from maybe not getting the answer was, gosh, we're taking, asking for all of this time and effort from providers and staff and patients. <laughs> And then we weren't using a lot of the data, right? Because eventually we, we would find that what we needed to know wasn't necessarily what we had. Um, so by sort of being a little more rigorous is maybe the right word about upfront sort of figuring out what we think works and then testing that, but then being willing to refine and go back and realize sometimes we were completely wrong and we need to ask different questions. I think that's really how it's changed our approach to data collection. I think both Suzanne and I sort of mentioned this a little bit, but in realist interviewing, you're really pretty focused. I mean, it's I like it because I feel like it's giving more agency to the people that we're working with um, that are experiencing the intervention. So, you know, we're, we're just saying like, this is kind of what we think might be going on. What is that? How does that land with you? Um, and especially working with providers, they're very willing to tell us that no, we're completely off our rocker and that's completely not what's <laughs> what's going on. But it creates these really interesting conversations where it's conversation and we're all sort of figuring it out together and hopefully getting to a better understanding of those underlying mechanisms. Then what I had done more traditionally, which is trying to say like, tell me your story, not that we, we still like stories, but tell me your story, you know, tell me your experience, but not sort of trying to drill down and narrow in um, sort of earlier on and during the actual data collection piece. Suzanne, I don't Can know. Can I just any. ask a quick follow-up to that? Yeah, of sure. course. Uh, which is, so it sounds like, or I just want to make sure I'm understanding, it sounds like in the interviews, one of the things that's different here than maybe a, a kind of typical kind of qualitative interview is that you actually say, you actually talk about, like, you you say out loud with them what the what you think the mechanism is, and you get them to give you feedback on it and to react to it. Okay. Okay, that's yeah. cool. And you know, it can that. look really, it can look really different depending on who you're talking to, right? Like with some folks, you know, we've tried being like, 
this is what we think the mechanism is. And other, you know, other folks who might be like, we think that there's something around relationships going on here. You know, how do you feel like relationships plays into it? You know, and also it depends a little bit on how refined your program theory is at that point in time, sort of how you're asking about it. So, Suzanne, did you have anything to add to that one? Well, I was just thinking about um, the, the language, the presentation of that question, Caroline, that um, you know, we, we still may be technically collecting the same data. We're still approaching our data collection in the same way. So it's interviews or we're doing observations and meetings and writing field notes and, and using those as data sources. Um, but yeah, the, the texture and nuance of the data we're gathering are invariably going to be different because in addition to maybe the questions we were asking before about this, this context and, and who's using tools and how are they using them in the EHR and to what ends are going to be supplemented uh, in the ways that Arwen was just describing. Okay. Um, so from Lisa, from a practical application standpoint, how do you think about the difference between realist evaluation approaches and grounded theory? So I kind of had to laugh when I saw that Lisa, because when I was talking about like these very vigorous, passionate debates on some of the listservs, um, and also there was a previous question about difference between critical realism and realist yes. evaluation. Um, so this idea is one that is passionately debated and there is not one answer. I would say, and Suzanne can probably talk a little bit more about this, there is um, a, an author, Hadi, I'm not even sure if I'm saying his name correctly, um, but who has what I found to be a really useful um, explanation of why grounded theory is actually very much in alignment with the realist approach and actually really mm -hmm. helpful. You will have other people who will say, heck no. <laughs> um, so I think it's a little bit sort of, you know, figuring out where your own approach lies. I don't know, Suzanne, did you want to? Yeah, and, and I did realize too that someone in the actual chat mentioned that if we answered things, we typed answers um, to people, uh, but didn't say we were answering them live, others can't see the responses. So there oh, was that- Oh, I apologize. Again, there was, I was... Yeah, I didn't know that either. <laughs> so there was that question about the relationship between realist approach and critical realism. And I had just answered it, um, thinking that everyone could see the response. But um, there too is sort of an area where there's lots of fun conversation happening. Is there a distinction? Is there not? Um, they definitely get blurred. And for some, and this is kind of the, the approach I take, critical realism is seen as the philosophy that underlies the actual approach, which is the scientific realism or, or realist evaluation. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's one answer. Um, and then, oh yes, around the grounded theory. Also just in terms of where you potentially blend um, the realist approach um, with other theories and other methodological approaches. Um, so Arwen was mentioning earlier with the Ascend project that we brought in um, normalization process theory to the Ascend analysis in order to give um, added explanatory um, power to the insights um, that we are proposing um, around our findings. Um, and so also uh, some will say, do a thematic approach, um, do a grounded approach, but also bring in your realist uh, ideas around causality to dig more deeply into those um, observations that are unobservable, well, or those mechanisms that are unobservable um, versus a grounded theory really looking at what's happening um, on the surface. So therein may lie some distinction. Okay, um, so there's a question, Jane, about realist review. So we have not done realist reviews. There is, so we are not the people to ask. There is uh, lots and lots of very good literature, including some pretty good studies sort of walking you through the steps. Um, I don't know if any of that is in the thing, but we could 
find them if it's not, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Not well, we and, and I guess that's something to also mention to everyone when we were talking about our, our use of a realist approach and showing how it's used at different stages and projects, um, we are realist informed. And some would say that in order to do a complete realist approach to a project, you would do a realist synthesis, um, also called a realist review. Um, so simply put, the literature review, um, so that you have all of the literature reviewed that gives you the program theories, all of that extant scholarship uh, to harness you with a sense of what you may see in your own data and, and then how you begin the process of articulating your own insights and then going back to that literature to see if uh, they can speak to one another. Okay, um, so Sarah asks about, you know, given the importance of context and realist evaluation, can we speak to the approach about conducting research remotely versus on site? Mm -hmm. So Sarah, I actually, it's an interesting question. I would say that one of the things, so as I said in the thing, I am distracted because I am always like, everything might be important. You never know. Like I want all the context all the time. And then I could get a little overwhelmed. So actually one of the things, that realist evaluation has been most useful for me personally is helping me focus a little more and figuring out early on which context actually might speak to sort of program change and those underlying mechanisms. So Suzanne might have a different opinion. I will say that from my perspective, because especially because it helps me focus more, that actually I feel a little more comfortable doing realist informed research remotely than I would have doing sort of more traditional research where I really felt I still want to be in the clinics. It's, it's not that, but mm -hmm. um, I feel a little bit more um, confident in what I'm finding out doing it remotely than I maybe would have been doing the sort of more traditional approach to qualitative research that I sort of was trained in. Suzanne, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I, I'm, I'm good with that. I always want to be live. <laughs> always, always, I do right? want to Just be personally, live. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah uh, definitely want to be live. But it it is um, an approach that I'm finding um, ah, definitely can give you some added sense of depth. Um, I think because of those important conversations we're having with uh, project participants, where you know we're we're kind of brainstorming with them as we're going along and um, we're, we're gaining really meaningful information in those conversations. And maybe in some respects, it makes up for the fact that we can't be there in person, but. Soon, hopefully. Yeah, um, let's return. Suzanne, I don't know if you know, this is it. So Scott asked about if there are particular journals that provide the best research on the realist approach. Oh. Yes, you have I, something to say. No, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I actually am about to figure that out. <laughs> okay. So but I, I will haven't say, done it yet. So yeah, and Scott. you can probably sort of tell from what Suzanne was saying, most of this, this research is much more uh, sort of, practitioners are much more in Europe and England mm -hmm. right now. Um, it is newer yep. in the United States. It has, it's, it's, has a little more depth uh, in Europe and the United States, and sorry, in England. So, um, I'm not sure about journals, actually. I know there's some good ones in uh, social science and medicine, as well as some other journals. Um, but in terms of where you were looking for this research and people that are really grounded in it and been doing it for a long time and in conversation with each other, it's it's not yet really in the United States. <laughs> you can check out, I'm putting it in the chat, um, the Ramsey's um, web page. I don't have the actual link, but you can plug in Ramsey's and, and realist evaluation. Um, I think it's in those slides too at the end, Suzanne. I think oh, great. Way. Okay. And um, they have a library of resources. Um, yeah. But a, a question, Scott, that I just over the weekend was like, oh gosh, I need to figure this out <laughs> as Arwen and I are moving in the direction of wanting to start publishing. On this yeah. work. So, so Laura, I know, I mean, I'm hopefully yeah, I've gotten most of them. I know that there was minutes. still this question that we didn't really talk, that I didn't get too in depth in the written answer about sort of the, the coding piece of it. I don't know if we have time to talk about it for a couple of minutes or if you want to, you need to close up, I think. 
Uh, no, you can go ahead. Look. I just need 30 seconds at the end. You go for it. Okay, so there was a question about sort of why why we felt like coding by context mechanism outcome was perhaps not the way to do this. Um, and so what we found, and we also then later found, I think maybe some of these uh, publications were written after we were trying to do it, but that sort of agreed. So a certain piece of data, there's I think two main things. A certain piece of data, it's not always clear whether it should be in the context or the mechanism or the outcome bucket, frankly. And depending on your program theory, things switch, right? Like something that is a mechanism at one point then can become an outcome and sort of the further iteration of where you're ending up. So we would spend a lot of time trying to be like, is this context, is this mechanism, is this outcome that was just a little bit wasted, frankly. Um, and also we really found, I think that Suzanne and I, we're really, I wasn't sure I would, but we're really loving coding by program theory because it allows us to sort of keep all of these potential interactions and ideas in conversation with each other in one code rather than having it sort of chunked out in ways that it's then hard to pull it back together. And so I think that trying to code by context mechanism outcome was was again chunking it out too much in ways that we didn't ultimately find helpful. Absolutely. Thanks for being excited about that, Arwen, because we <laughs> have become, <laughs> Like I said, As you can tell, hours, it didn't we're work. thrilled. Yeah. We're, you know, we're um, tweaking our our code books in exciting ways, and then we go back into the data, and 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 then we get very excited that we find that our coding is coming more easily, um, because we're we're refining and we're finding refining um, more precision. Mm -hmm. So I think we're done. I just wanted to say, well, thank you very much. And we had no idea mm -hmm. that there were going to be so many experts, obviously, based on the obviously, questions. Obviously, yes. Based in on the questions, evaluation you know and critical realism. <laughs> Probably good. We didn't know we would have been more nervous. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and I yeah, thanks for everyone. Laura. And Laura, thank you. And Dylan, really? thank you for guiding us. I love that you guys are giving us thanks, but we should we owe you a big thanks for being our inaugural speakers today. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. It seems like this was a uh, we got a big thumbs up um, on this new series. So I just want to say um, many many thanks to joining. Please stay tuned for the next conversation, which will be with um, our amazing, brilliant colleagues. Uh, Miguel Marino and Jorge Kaufman, who um, not surprisingly work with Suzanne and Arwen on lots of projects, uh, brilliant minds working together and doing really complimentary work, but they do more quantitative research and are going to share um, uh, uh, some, of, some of their work in September. It should be another really good conversation. Uh, if you have additional ideas, email them to us at siren at uh, uh, at ucsf.edu um, and for sure all of the announcements about the next workshops will be in the siren newsletter so stay tuned really really appreciate you all have a great week